Hi friends, good morning. Um, I made it up to uh, this awesome spot last night and it was a little bit too late to uh, film. So I uh, slept in my car and I just woke up and made my bed. I have everything usually ready and we're ready to explore. In uh, today's menu, we're gonna start with a class of Pilates because I really need it. I uh, was a little bit too lazy to put all the seats away, uh, the stowaway seats, and I ended up sleeping in the back seat and I kept waking up in the middle of the night over and over again uh, because it's a little shorter than my body. So I was getting kind of uncomfortable and cold. <laughs> So, uh, I'm uh, hurting a little bit today, so I definitely need uh, a good Pilates uh, mat workout uh, to get back to my usual self. Now, I just wanted to show you this gorgeous view, and let's see if I can... Look at that! There's so much snow still here, look where I am. There are no people here, it's just me and my car. And we're going now to the top, right over there. Um, there is a lake there, which I usually go to with my children. And uh, in winter time, it freezes. So I'm gonna go and check how frozen the lake is. And if it's frozen, it's not really deep, it's tiny. It's a tiny little uh, crater lake. So, um, I'm gonna check how deep it is and if, oh, how frozen it is. And if it's frozen enough, then I'm gonna set my uh, mat and we'll do some Pilates together. And thankfully I have my uh, waterproof pants, so I don't even need a mat. I can just do it like that, maybe for extra cushioning. Well, explore, let's go do some snow Pilates. We are here and it's frozen. Uh, Let's do some Pilates. All right, guys, I think we're ready to start. Today, we're going to begin our workout by warming up our spine. And as you know from previous classes, if you haven't checked, check them out. Our spine can move in four different directions. It can flex and that it can extend. It can rotate to both sides. And it can also side bend. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to flex, extend, flex, extend. Help yourself with the arms and extend. Round forward, chest opens. Round forward, open the heart. Forward and back. Forward and back. Forward and back. And now we're gonna bend side to side, side to side. Help yourself with the arms, allowing your shoulder joints to warm up as well, and your wrist joints. As much movement as you can get out of this little swaying action, do it. We're gonna side bend, side bend. If you wanna help yourself with bending, uh, by bending the knees, do it. It's a free warm up. No, not many rules. Just trying to take the spine through all of its motions. And left, and left, right. Two more like this. And now let's begin to spin. We're going to rotate the spine side to side, allowing our arms to gain momentum to propel us a little bit further to the right, a little further to the left. And spin, 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 spin. Keep going for three, two, and last one. And you should feel your spine already being nice and warm. We're going to now go down onto our back and do a uh, three of the most important exercises that I consider to be uh, a good uh, morning, quick morning workout. We're going to begin on our back and we're going to do first the 100 exercise. 100 is 
super famous warm-up exercise that even um, alpine climbers use to warm up the body when they are in the snow like this. So super appropriate. Let's go ahead and go onto your back. Lift your arms up, bring our uh, feet onto the ground and our knees bent. Let's take a deep inhale in through the nose and on the exhale, lift your chest. Reach your arms forward. Make sure you're lifted to the bottom of your shoulder blade. So the tip of your scapula is just lifting off the mat. Your belly button is pulling deeply down towards the bottom of the lake <laughs> or the floor and you're going to begin to pump the arms breathing in for five counts and breathing out for five counts make sure you stay lifted with the chest and not just the head and the shoulders and the neck it's your chest that is lifting from here you can always lift your legs to tabletop to progress forward make sure you're doing one at a time and you can also extend your legs. I recommend starting by extending the legs straight up. And if that works for you, then begin to lower the legs down only as low as you can support your lower back on the mat. The moment you feel your lower back lifting off the mat, bring your head legs a little bit higher. And we're gonna pump like this for a hundred counts. So breathing in for five and breathing out for five. 10 times and then we're going to bring our knees in lower our legs down and lower onto the mat we're going to do a little stretch here which is uh, not a part of pilates exercises but we're always integrating other methods in to make sure we get everything done so we're going to do a little bit of spinal rotation and hip opening together we're gonna stack the feet and the knees together one on top of the other and spill them over to the right from here we're gonna open the left knee out to the left and then bring our right knee over the left and the head can rotate in the opposite direction of the knees to increase the stretch open into a butterfly and then close and spin and open and close head rotates in the opposite direction when you open the knees to the sides make sure that you're really pressing them down allowing for that stretch in the front of the hip and the back of the hip to happen and open close spin and open and rotate two more times and last time and let's come all the way in and lift ourselves up usually i lift myself up with uh another exercise which is a roll up right we begin with our uh, legs extended straight in front of us our powerhouse engaged arms reaching up over the head we take a deep back uh, inhale on the exhale we bring our arms up to the sky then not the chin keeping the shoulders down pulling the belly in we're gonna lift ourselves all the way up into a seated position. And since this is a short version of my Pilates mat workout, we're moving on fairly quick. And the next exercise is going to be to counteract our shoulder, uh, our spinal flexion. It's going to be spinal extension and the exercise is called swimming. How appropriate that it is swimming because we're at the lake, <laughs> right? So we're gonna swim now together. We're going to begin prone on the belly with the legs extended and about a fist distance apart from each other. Arms shoulder distance apart, extended all the way up. Powerhouse engaged. From here, we're going to lift our right arm and left leg together along with the chest, but not the head. The head stays down and then lower everything down and then alternating side lift hold and lower down and lift hold lower down other side and lower and lift and lift notice that for now we're getting all the way down to the ground on the next one we're gonna lift everything up and from here begin to lift and lower arms and legs without touching the ground 
Breathing in, two, three, four, five. Breathing out, two, three, four, five. If this becomes too complicated, you can open your arms to the sides and do it this way. Keep your chest lifted, or you can reach your arms all the way back. Keep lifting your chest and then swimming the legs super duper fast. Breathing in, two, three, four, five. Breathing out, two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five. Out, two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five. Out, two, three, four, five. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And lower down. Bring your arms right under your shoulders. Press up and into a child's pose. And take a deep breath in through the nose. And an exhale out through the mouth. From here, we're going to come into our third exercise. And this one is going to be our side twist. And I chose it as a third exercise for my mini workout because it uh, uh, includes in itself a spinal um, side bend and then spinal rotation both together. So it makes a perfect exercise to um, move our spine through all uh, possible ways of movement, right? Through all phases of motion. So we're going to start by setting up our starting position. Our hand is slightly away from the shoulder. Our uh, knees can be right one on top of the other and our hips are in line with the hand and the feet. We're going to start by opening up our left knee and stepping our left foot flat on the mat. From here, we're gonna lift our hips up and reach our arm up and over, drawing a circle. You can turn your head to look at your uh, right hand. And from here, I see that I'm a little skewed. So I'm going to come back in, draw the circle, close the knees back up and move my right hand a little bit over to make sure I'm in a beautiful straight line. I'm gonna do it again. I'm going to first open the left knee, stepping the foot firmly on the ground to allow for the surface from where to push off of. And then I'm gonna lift just my hips up and extend the arm up to the sky. From here, I'm going to continue to reach the arm all the way up and over and turn my head to look down. Now make sure you're not sinking into your right shoulder, but lifting up and away from it. And now let's draw the arc again on the way back, lower the hips and rest the arm on the top and close the shape. We're going to progress from here. This time we're not going to lift, leave our right shin on the ground, but we're going to lift all the way up and twist. It's going to require uh, a lot of uh, strength in the powerhouse, not just in the shoulder. Make sure you're not leaning onto your hand, but shifting your weight th from the core into the feet, into the, the feet that are standing and into the hand equally. So we're going to begin in our starting position and then open the knee to the side and now shoot the body up, press out, make the arc with the arm and then from here, continue to go all the way down and under the armpit. And then dive out, join a beautiful arc, retracing the steps, and then come all the way back down and all the way back in. So because we're keeping this arm fairly close and the legs fairly close to the body, we are creating this small space where we can't get into the side plank and the body has nowhere to go but to twist. So we're going to do it again, watch me. We're gonna open the knee to the side. We're going to set, send the hips all the way up, extending both legs straight, and then reach, look over our right palm. And then from here, we're going to thread our left hand in between our, our right arm and our leg and dive there as much as you can, sending your right hip up and then reverse the motion and reach and lower and close all the way down. Let's go over to the other side. 
before the lake melts under me, I'm going to finish up with three uh, side twists here. We're going to begin just like we did on the other side. Uh, by the way, our right foot now is um, separate from our, uh, from our left, right? So the feet are not stacked one on top of the other. Only the knees are stacked one on top of the other. From here, we're going to open our right knee, send our hips up, and then follow the hand and then look down to make sure we're fully aligned. I'm a little misaligned, so I'm going to align myself to make sure that the front of the hip is fully open and then follow the arc back, lower the hips down, lower the hand and close the shape, making sure that I'm not sinking through my left shoulder here. So keep pressing all the way up. We're going to now lift all the way up and twist. Right, uh, right knee opens, lift the hips, straighten the legs, follow the right arm with your gaze and then dive all the way under and through and then come back out into your side plank and then follow the arm all the way back and lower down and close. Wow, the snow is beginning to melt under me. So the uh, surface is becoming a little less stable, but we're gonna do one more and then finish up. And lift and dive and twist. Hold it here and then come out and lower and close it all the way down. All right, this was an awesome warm up for us for today. I feel the snow melting underneath me, so I'm going to move quickly and we have a ton of other cool things to do today. We are, well, the rain is tomorrow, so mushroom hunting uh, and mushroom identification will be tomorrow. Today, I think we're going to uh, do a lot of other things like visiting very beautiful waterfalls and maybe doing some tutorials there or maybe just walking around and seeing how things look. All right, I hope you enjoyed this workout. I'm gonna run before the before I end up wet inside the lake and I will catch up with you in a little bit. Good and to see you. Before I take off, two people showed up so I was right on time I just want to just see this beauty here and I will try to add a video of how this looks in the summertime because I come here all the time in the summer and then look compare how it looks in the winter pretty amazing what nature can do right every day is different in nature every time i come here it looks just a little bit different and always very very magical i think someone was building a snowman right there Let's see how close we can get nice all right a little clip from the summertime from the same spot Okay, I'll, off to our next adventure. I uh, will come back here because I'm probably going to sleep on this mountain top again. I like that there is no reception here and uh, my thoughts are very clear. Uh, I get all these new ideas and um, profound knowledge seems to come in whenever I spend time away from um, electronics. Off we go. Buckle up.
this crazy idea that I wanted to share with you. So there is this amazing crystal shop where uh, I am right now. And uh, of course, me and my children go there all the time. I say that all the time, I guess. But uh, over the years, since 2017, right now it's 2024, um, we've been going there every time we come in. It's kind of like a tradition. We um, come to Shasta and the first thing we go is the kids want to get some crystals or just look around or maybe some essential oils and such. Now, uh, I've been listening to hand pan music lately and I am dying to get a hand pan drum and they are a little bit on an expensive side so I had this idea where I'll ask the owner of the store to um, use instruments that I previously bought in the same store as a partial payment for the hand pan drum so I gathered my other instruments, which is a, an ocean drum, I'll show you in a little bit, um, and another little, um, what is it, uh, it's not a hand pan, but it's, it's another type of a drum, it's small, I'll show you. As, so uh, basically I'm gonna be brave right now and I'm going to go to Kathy, her name is Kathy, and I'm going to ask her straightforward, um, can I uh, give her um, those instruments as a partial payment for the hand pen and then the rest I'll uh, obviously pay uh, with money um, because I know how important it is uh, for them right, to sustain their business. But let's see what she says. I know it's a kind of uh, an awkward thing to ask, but um, I highly encourage you if you ever have ideas to always act on them so because I encourage you I have to lead by example and I'm gonna go ahead and do that so we're gonna do that right now but before that I want to show you something gorgeous This would be great for our tree identification video. Let me get the book. Here is the book that I got um, because I watched a YouTube channel and this guy, I really liked how he used this book to identify plants and um, it is called um, Plants of the Pacific Northwest Coast, Washington, Oregon, British Columbia and Alaska. And it's written by uh, Pojar and McKinnon. Now, um, we are uh, right below Oregon border. So I consider this area because it's a little bit higher in elevation. I uh, still think that the climate, climate uh, matches that of the Pacific Northwest. So here we are and um, I, am, I have my book with me. And this book, I really liked it because it has um, a very interesting and sort of, uh, sort of simple, not too simple, key that um, allows you to identify any coniferous or uh, deciduous tree. Now, the first and foremost is um, the big difference in two t the two types of trees, right? Are the coniferous and um, those are the ones that are uh, also called evergreen. They carry cones and they normally do not shed their leaves, which look or look like needles uh, in winter time. And then there are deciduous trees like these ones. And this is all perfect example, by the way. Yes, they shedded all of their leaves for winter. And now they're bare and they're gonna start uh, budding again soon. Now, so let's identify this tree. We're going to first 
look at the needles and this is a baby tree so i'm not sure if it's going to be a little bit harder for us to do this since um it does not have uh cones or does it let's see let's let's look better i'm gonna turn the camera the other way hold on tree for identification and now we are moving uh, to our book page uh, 28 and 29 holds this wonderful key to help us identify what kind of tree it is and as I mentioned before the first thing right the first split is um, between all the trees right is 1a uh, trees that have leaves needle-like or scale-like evergreen trees and seeds in which are usually uh, in cones, so uh, not enclosed in fruit. These are conifer trees, right? These are the trees that the leaves, these are leaves, look like needles and they stay with them over winter for the most part. And then the seeds are enclosed not in fruit like an apple, uh, but uh, or a, a nut, uh, but enclosed in uh, a cone. And then the second, right? So one A, the first thing would would say either it's one A or one B. And one B would be, um, oh, let me focus it here. Perfect. Leaves broad and except for our but our bodice annually deciduous seed enclosed in a fruit so this would be a deciduous tree right again i'm showing that would be a deciduous tree uh, that uh, had broad leaves like this and it shattered its leaves for the winter and its seeds would be enclosed in a fruit I can't find any right now, but I'm sure we can work on that a little bit later. Now let's focus on uh, 1A. So now that I know that this is a conifer, clearly, right? Because uh, the, the leaves are needle-like or scale-like and it's evergreen. Moving on, we know that it's 1A and then 1A is split into 2A and 2B. 2A leaves scale-like concealing the twigs. And 2B is leaf needle-like, not concealing the twigs. Let's see, are these leaves needle-like or scale-like, first of all? They're needle-like, right? They look like needles. And are they concealing the twigs? Can you see the twig? We can see the twig, right? So they're not concealing the twigs. There we go, you can see the twig clearly here. This is definitely 2B, leaves needle-like, not concealing the twigs. So if we are moving to 2B, right? So then we're moving to 4, and 4 has 4A and 4B. Let's start with 4A. 4A, needles in clusters, or 4B, needles not in clusters. Are these needles in clusters? No, they're not in clusters, right? They're kind of uh, like individual needles. Mm -hmm. So now needles not in clusters, we chose 4B, needles not in clusters, which is going to lead us to number six or 6A right here, needles stalkless, 6B needles stalked. Let's see, because the tree is alive and I don't have a needle, I can't just break it, I won't do that. Uh, I'm going to have to examine the tree closer and hopefully you can examine it with me and the camera will, oh, I have a perfect shot for you guys, right? There. Right there. 
do you see that the needle is stockless? It's coming out right of the, out of the twig, right? There is no little stalk where it would be uh, connected to. I will show you the difference later, but for now, we are definitely going with the stockless needle. Let me go ahead and get back out. So we're going right back to our 6A. Well, if we chose 6A, we're going to go to 7. And 7 has 7A and 7B. 7A branches without spray-like foliage, appearing half-rounded by upswept needles, needles with lines of stomata on both surfaces. Um, that's 7A. Let's read it again one more time. Branches without spray-like foliage, appearing half-rounded by unswept needles. Needles with lines of stomata on both surfaces. Does it look like a spray? Somewhat, right? I would say it does look like, like somebody sprayed these needles, I'm, I'm assuming. And are they upswept a little bit? Oh, I think this would be a good example, right? They're not really uniform, they're upswept. Well, first let's read 7B, I'm sorry, which might actually answer a lot of our questions. Okay, so 7A, branches without spray-like foliage appearing half-rounded by, by up-swept needles. Needles with lines of stomata on both surfaces, meaning on the top surface and on the bottom surface. And 7B would be, where is it, where is it, where is it? 7B would be branches with spray-like foliage needles with lines of stomata on lower surface only so branches with spray-like foliage needles with lines of stomata on lower surface only Ooh, we're gonna have to get close to the plant and and see whether the lines of stomata are on both sides do we see lines of stomata on the top surface here i don't think so unless i do i do see a line but it, uh, it's not white. So I, I think we're gonna have to research. Ooh, and definite lines of stomata here on the bottom. I think right there is a good view. You see the lines of stomata? Stomata are tiny openings or pores in plant tissue that allow for gas exchange. Stomata are typically found in plant leaves, but can also be found in some stems. Specialized cells known as guard cells surround stomata and function to open and close stomatal pores. And the top does not have them, right? It's just bright green. So now we definitely know that it's 7B. If we chose 7B, which is for sure 7B, then we move to 9. And then number 9, let's find it. Where is 9? Oh, 9 is right here, right under 7B. Needles spread in definite two-ranked arrangement, three to four centimeters long, seed cones light green. Or 9B, upper needles, upper needles on twig point forward. No definite two-ranked arrangements. Needles one to three centimeter long, seeds cone seed cones purple so just looking at the arrangement of the needles here and i don't think they have uh, a two line arrangement right it they are more spray like and uh just go kind of all over And then the either the, the other uh, identifier is that the cones are uh, simply purple, right? Remember the cones? We looked at them at the very, very beginning. And the cones are certainly purple on this tree. Let me try to get a good view for you. 
and they're not light green. So there is no arrangement for the needles, right? You see how they're not arranged in twos. And the seed cones, which are very young on this tree and it's kind of hard to identify, but I think um, we can definitely say that they are purple and not light green, right? There we go. We are now definitely going with 9B upper needles on twig point forward no definite two rank arrangement needles one to three centimeters long and seeds in cones that are purple now we haven't checked one thing we haven't checked whether upper needles on twigs point forward we know that there is definite definite no definite two ranked arrangement Let's see if the top needles are pointing forward. Well, this is a little bit tricky. Let's see, right here, top needles. Oh, they do point forward. Right? The top needles are pointing forward. The top needles are pointing forward. Where else can we see that good? Right? Forward and up a little bit. Forward and up. All right. And uh, although I'm not sure about that, I'm definitely sure about uh, no arrangement. And I'm definitely very certain about... Oh, look, little bugs are running around and I can hear them. Uh, I'm also certain about the color of the cones. So uh, now that we chose 9B, we are moving to... Oh, we got the name. It's called uh, 9B, 9B, focus, 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 9B, 9B, right there. 9B brings us to Abis Amabilis. Abis Amabilis. All right, let's see. Abies Amabilis. Woo! Did we find the right tree? I think so. The bark looks different, but it is a young tree. Right? I think we got the right tree, guys. Abies Amabilis or the Pacific Silver Fir. I think we found the right uh, fur because look, if we would have chosen the two ranked needle arrangement, it would have taken us to Abis Grandis in the book and just like on the right side here, and that would have been grand fur. So Abis Amabilis, commonly known as the Pacific Silver Fur, is a fur native to the Pacific Northwest of North America, occurring in the Pacific Coast Ranges and the Cascade Range. It is also commonly referred to in English as the white fir, red fir, lovely fir, amabilis fir, cascades fir, or silver fir. While heading to that bigger tree, uh, that is definitely a coniferous tree right in front of me, I came across um, this cone. And that's another fun way that I'm gonna try to identify a tree just by looking at the cone. I don't know if it's possible at all. I'm sure it's not the scientific way, but I can definitely tell uh, that it's not from the ABs, uh, the one that we, ide we just identified, right? Because this is how ABs cones look and look at this cone, right? Looks quite different. And also what we know about Abis amabilis cones is that uh, the pollen cones are reddish, seed cones erect, deep purple, barrel shaped, uh, eight, to two to, uh, eight to 12 centimeters long, fall apart while still on the tree, leaving the central spike standing into winter. Um, not sure all, what, what all of that means yet, but uh, 
cones, pollen cones reddish, seed cones erect, deep pollen cones. Oh, so it has two types of cones, pollen cones. Let's now, we only have one picture here, so I'm not sure, um, I will try to look online, the difference on uh, Abies amabilis, the one that we just identified, uh, the different pictures, the ones, uh, the, uh, the cones that are pollen cones and then the seed cones how they look because here we have only this one i searched for the two types of abies amabilis cones and came up with this picture which shows two types of abies amabilis cones and came up with this picture which shows our female uh, uh, the female seed cones the ones that are purplish and then spent male pollen cone, uh, that reddish little guy. There we go. And this cone, let's see if we have anything in the book that uh, it can belong to. Let's start from the very beginning and look at the cones here on the coniferous trees. Well, this one is Western hemlock cone, no. It's not it. This one is mountain hemlock. No. And this is Douglas fir. No. And this is Abies amabilis or amabilis fir, the one we try to identify. I don't think they belong to them. Now this cone right here is uh, from Grand fir. It's a Grand fir cone. That's not it. And this one right here is subalpine fir, and that's not it. And noble fir, no. And Sitka spurs cone, no. And now we're getting a little closer. It looks like a pine cone. Yeah, so we have, woo, it looks like this, right? Doesn't it look like that? Just like this little drawing here, shore pine right western pine very cool it does look like shore pine or western pine and then the rest are not pine cones oh yeah there are more pine cones western red cedar let's see red adler has oh things like this all right yes so it must be a pine of sort and um i'm not sure if there are other pines here since we're just below uh, the pacific northwest coast um we're just at the border so maybe there are other species of pine here as well but this cone definitely looks like either the shore pine cone which we're not at the shore so that would be a western pine cone. Ah, there's so much on this forest floor, so much to identify. These guys are coming from another tree, right? Ah, oh, I can spend all day here. Maybe we'll come back tomorrow or a little bit later today. For now, let's head back and um, do some other fun stuff. Bye. This is the part actually that I've been told about so many times, and or maybe I've read about it, that um, when you uh, get deeper and deeper and deeper into something, especially into nature, it takes you longer and longer to uh, move from point A to point B because you find everything to be uh, super interesting. And uh, it is so true. Uh, I can't stop I, everything here in this, just on the floor, you know, it used to me to look to me like, oh, okay, whatever, first floor, and I'm just making my way, you know, here, there, here, there, here, there, moving quickly from one place to another, getting bored, and now I feel like uh, I'm, I've slowed down so much, and I feel like it's still not enough time, like I need to slow down even more to find, um, to find out what everything is, what what where things belong to. Now, while uh, uh, searching, uh, well, tomorrow it's going to be rain, so I'm trying to uh, find my way around already and see where there are dead or dying trees. And I already found one. It's right here, 
and uh, I'm sure it lived a long and beautiful life. And then I found something else next to it, and I think it's a fungus, guys. Oh my God, let's take a look right here. Look at this guy, oh my God. How amazing. Look at this fungus. Hi. Wow, guys, this is so exciting. I don't want to disturb you. May I just move this a little bit to get a closer look? Wow. Now, this was just steps away from the uh, tree that we were identifying. I just got the cones and then I found the dead tree. And what do you know, right away, there is fungus, fungi. And then um, I would love to identify this one, but I left the book. Uh, the mushroom identification book in the car. So let's take a good mental image for now. And oh, we also found a nut. What is that? Oh, look. So this must be a fruit from uh, a deciduous tree, right? Sometimes fruits look like this. They don't look like an actual apple. But this is probably where the seeds would be from a deciduous tree. Oh, there's so much to identify guys and I'm so happy that I found this guy here. Oh my god. All right, let's look around just a tad more. Look how big it is. Right? Let's look around this dying tree just a bit more and then uh, head back to the car. Because I, uh, I didn't venture out deep into the woods but I did not take my compass right now with me and um, therefore I'm not going to be going any further, any further. From here I can still see my car, so that's the only way, reason I'm being um, this adventurous. Let's see if there is any other fungus that we can find other mushrooms that we can find on this dead or on this dead tree not right now but that fungi is so so cool how awesome it's just Wow, it looks like a brain. It does look like um, one of those fake morels that I've picked up from the coast region as far as like the brain-like looking structure. It's gorgeous. Hi friends. So we made it back to the car and um, I'm gonna just have a little bit of water that I got from the mountains here. Uh, last night and uh, then I feel like I have to uh, take out the book and we have to check in uh, for that mushroom. Let's flip through the pages and find the right picture. This is good water. People come from um, all over to get water here. Uh, that runs off the mountains. This is considered to be the headwaters for the Sacramento River. Mm. Mm. I've never had tastier water in my life. I drive eight and a half to 10 hours uh, up here just for this water here. you can taste the purity in the water. I feel like purity is a, it should be a, an identif identification, uh, like a value of thing, right? Um, let's say, um, a, or like a taste identification probably too, because 
you can feel when uh, the water does not have any information it's just pure it's just got cleaned off from all the information that it carried and now uh, it's available in its purest form uh, and then it's gonna go back obviously through this uh, cycle of uh, picking up information and then again uh, getting recycled and cleaned up okay for the book let me go get it guys this is my mushroom identification guide uh, national audubon society field guide to mushrooms of north america um, kind of big uh, big area i heard that it's best to get a mushroom identification guides uh, that are more local um, i will do that hopefully today uh, but for now this is what we have to work with so i'm going to um, just flip through the pages with you and see if we can find a mushroom that resembles the one that we just saw and then uh, try to identify it. All right. Woo! So my phone died and I uh, had to continue later at home. Um, I found these pictures in the book that resemble our find. The, this one is snowbank bank false morel. This one is also snowbank false morel. Let's read about snowbank false morel on page three. Three, eight. And there we go. Snowbank false morel. Gyromitra gigas. Brownish brain like cap on whitish branched stalk. Hmm, so it's a branched stalk. You know what? Our cap was so low that it was very, very or our stock was so short that it was very hard to say whether it was branched or not. And since we did not uh, unearth it, we can't uh, identify that correctly, but we still will try. So snowbank false morel, brownish uh, brain-like cap on whitish, whitish uh, branch stock. I don't think it was branched, but let's read nevertheless. So cap, uh, one and five eighth to four inches wide and high, brain like to deeply wrinkled, yellow brown becoming dingy chestnut. Interior chambered, often with cracked, brittle whitish flesh. And stalk, two to four inches long and thick, somewhat short, whitish, and very broad with multiple channels. We wouldn't be able to say the channel part, but it was definitely short. Uh, edibility choice with caution and uh, lookalikes oh habitat on humus under conifers especially near melting snowbanks range on mountains in colorado pacific northwest and california yay that was correct lookalikes g fastigiata can only be differentiated by its spores so spore print absolutely required Comments, also known as the giant Heldella, the snowbank false morel is the most widely eaten false morel in North America. It often weighs up to two pounds. It is not known to occur east of the Rocky Mountains. All reported poisonings from the false morels have been in the east and midwest. All right, I wouldn't eat it regardless. And now this one looks I think way more like it because we really can't see the stem at all. And this would be the thick stalked false morel. And let's see, page 337. So returning 337 to almost exactly where we just were, right before that. Ooh. Oh conifer false morel that's the deadly one but no we're gonna read right now thick stock false morel 
Gyromitra fastigiata and its brownish wrinkled to brain like cap on whitish short thick stalk. I would say that ours looked a little bit more like this one. Um, and the cap is 3 4th to 4 inches wide, brain shaped to lobed with longitude, longitudinal folds longitudinal so going in one direction let's check back in with our images yellow brown to red brown above paler below oh so we can identify a little bit by the color here so the cap is yellow brown to red brown above and paler below. Let's check back in with our image. I'd say that definitely fits uh, the description. Interior chambered, flesh brittle. We wouldn't be able to say that because we did not unearth and take this mushroom with us. And let's keep this wow, the stalk thick. We didn't see the stalk really at all. It just was so short that we know for sure. And uh, season, late April to late May. And we are in the middle of April. Habitat, on the ground in hardwood forests or mixed wood. We were definitely in a mixed wood. Range, northeast. North America, Rocky Mountains, areas of the Pacific Northwest. Lookalikes, the deadly G. esculenta, has unbranched stalk, lacks knobs on the ends of spores. Comments, because this species is closely related to the deadly conifer false morel or G. esculenta, it should not be eaten. Also known as G. corfi. Hmm, let's now read about that deadly false morel, conifer false morel, gyromitra esculenta. So let's see if we can find the picture for it in this book. If not, then maybe we'll get something online. By the way, I noticed that all of these, the morels themselves and black morels and all these guys, um, are in category of morels, stinkhorns, and other club-shaped mushrooms. Just saying. All right, I can't find that uh, the picture for, oh, conifer false morel. This one right here, conifer false morel, page 336. You know what, guys? I have found conifer false morel before when I was um, in the Pacific Northwest and I was there a couple of, well, maybe a month ago and I found, this was my first trip looking for mushrooms and I found this guy, I think, or something very similar. It was definitely a false morel. I wonder if it was the conifer false morel because I, that's how I found it. Maybe I'll find a picture and I'll plug it in here as well. So conifer false morel. Description, brownish brain-like to saddle shaped cap on short wider stock. So it's definitely not the one that we saw together this time. It's uh, ours looked way more like snowbank false morel or gabled false morel or um, thick stocked false morel. But just out of curiosity, let's read about this deadly, deadly um, false morel, which is conifer false morel. And 337, 337, coming back. Sorry, got distracted there. Brownish brand like to saddle, sh saddle shaped cap on short whitish stock. Cap. One and one fourth to four inches wide, two to four inches high, brain shaped, yellow, yellow brown, or bay above, lighter below, or bay above, lighter below, wrinkled or folded but not pitted. Interior chambered, 
flesh brittle. Stalk, three fourths to two inches long, three eighths to one thick. Whitish, unbranched, but often fluted. Scruffy to early smooth, to nearly smooth. Hollow, or with one to two chambers. Spores, elliptical, smooth, with two oil drops. And edibility, deadly. Season April to early June. Habitat on the ground under conifers throughout North America, most common in north and in mountains. Hmm, true. Lookalikes, true morels have honeycombed caps that are hollow, not chambered. Comments, also called Helvella esculenta. Other common names include brain mushroom, beefsteak morel, Lord Chell and edible false morel. Scientists have discovered that the conifer false morel develops a compound similar to one used in the manufacture of rocket fuel. It causes acute illness and has been fatal in a few instances. It also produces tumors in laboratory animals. Its species name is Esculenta or edible because the toxins may be removed by drying and rehydrating or by a process of boiling, rinsing and boiling again. Even so, the removal of toxins is sometimes incomplete. In some lo locations where the toxic concentration is apparently minimal, the mushroom has been cooked and eaten like a true morel with no apparent ill effects. However, this species cannot be recommended for eating. All right. So there we go. That's our mushroom. What a cool find, right? That was exciting. This is the mushroom that I found um, on my first ever mushroom identifying trip. And now back to our episode. Hello, my fellow adventurers. And what you saw right now is a river that uh, will lead us to a hidden waterfall. Now, I hope that you can hear me well because the river is very loud. And um, yeah, that's that. And I don't have a mic, but um, there is a, a trick about this little waterfall or getting to the waterfall to be exact. To get to the waterfall, we have to hike on the railroad, this railroad, and then there are actually it's a working railroad so the trains will be passing and we would have to um, steer clear <laughs> so on one side there's going to be a mountain and on the other side the river there is a little bit of space for people to stand while the train is passing uh, now i've done this before uh, several times and i've never had a train pass by while i'm hiking uh, but it always came right after I finished the hike. Let's see if that happens tomorrow, today or not. Um, I think I'm prepared for both. Uh, now, this, these waterfalls are just gorgeous. And if the sound permits, I would love to teach a class there. Let's give it a shot. Come with me. Okay, I wish that the next um, 
technology will be able to capture not just the views and the sound but also the smell because the smell here right now is absolutely amazing somebody's burning wood and the smell of uh, fresh wood burning and uh, the pines and the trees all around me is just to die for <laughs> all right i'll see you at the falls bye guys i just saw a snake uh she passed by right under the rails and oh my god that was pretty crazy but really awesome let's see there she is there she is hi beautiful i believe that's a gardener snake oh there she is hi beautiful i'm sorry i know you were getting some sun i'm going to let you get sun oh wasn't that awesome all right this is gonna be a cool adventure hi friends so it's a pretty lengthy walk uh, to the falls so i figured i will use this time uh, to talk a little bit about uh, Pilates and uh, what I wanted to talk about specifically is um, the fact that uh, well many of you uh, think that it's stretching and I would uh, um, agree halfway because Pilates is the method of exercising so uh, any exercise of course if you get technical uh, includes in itself uh, a, uh, an equal amount of strengthening and stretching and oh, the head is getting into my eyes wait a moment all right so uh, fair, fair to say that most systems uh, include stretching into their um, ratio but uh, I wouldn't say that Pilates is stretching. Now, we do do some stretching in the Pilates, um, in the program, right? There is always, uh, there are always exercises that we start with that uh, stretch our body, warm it up. And then after we work out, we also stretch because the muscles are already warm and it's the perfect time to get into those deep stretches and, um, and uh, breathe through them to open up your range of motion when the uh, muscle is already nice and pliable. Let me get back to the railroad because it's a little hard to walk on the rocks. Now, the stretches that I incorporate and a lot of other teachers, the stretches that we incorporate into Pilates uh, math classes are uh, coming from uh, yoga or just uh, from our knowledge of the body so <clears throat> some stretches they, they were not initially uh, they're not always not all of them are part of the actual Pilates return to life series which is the 34 original math exercises now those exercises will stretch you but they're active right they're, they're actual exercises now um these uh, stretches that we use in the beginning of the just making sure the train is not coming in the beginning of the uh, uh, our routine to warm up right uh, those are dynamic stretches that simply come from the knowledge of the body and from understanding of what the body needs to do to warm up so basically, imagine, right, before beginning the exercise, let's say you were sleeping and uh, <clears throat> your body fully relaxed, uh, here. your body fully relaxed and uh, uh, I wouldn't say it got stiff, but maybe a little bit. You need to stretch out the spine before 
adding um, weight onto the spine before beginning to exercise, right? You wouldn't do, let's say, a rollover exercise where you bring your heads over your, uh, your legs over your head. Oh, that's a train. All right, am I in a good spot for the train to pass through? Well, I hope so. All right, let's see, this is gonna be fun. Oh, all right, let's see. Let's see how, how the train goes. I don't know how far I need to be from it. This is the first, I'm so excited. All right, let's see. Oh my gosh, <laughs> here we go. I got off the trucks, so I'm about this far from the trucks. I hope this is enough. Well, I guess we'll find out. Let's film it, let's film the train. If anything, I'm jumping into the river. <laughs> All right, let's go. I'm gonna turn the camera around. Oh, that's cool. This is not a big train. This is quite a small one. So we're definitely safe. This is cool. Look at that. Hi. Hi. Whoa. So cool. Well, that was very, very cool and exciting because I actually was secretly hoping that one time the train will pass while I'm hiking the trail, which is this narrow, right? And the road is right there because I wanted to see what it's like, right? Is it safe for me to take my children here? Will we have enough space to uh, move out of the way? And I will tell you right now that yes, we have plenty of room and you can hear the train coming because they know people are going to the waterfall here. So you can hear the train coming from a long before it actually reaches you. So you have plenty of time to move and find a safe spot. And um, uh, some places like, let's say this pa passage is a little bit narrower than the rest. So because you have that in enough time to react, you can just walk to the uh, place where it's a little bit wider. Now let's get back to our uh, conversation about stretching and Pilates. So Pilates teaches you anatomy, a lot of it. You really understand how your body moves and um, all of its possibilities, right? Like how our spine can move. It can uh, flex, extend. Uh, rotate, move side to, uh, bend side to side, right? We find out how every joint moves. So, just logically, Pilates teachers know what to do to stretch and warm up your body. Because a warm up, what is a warm up, right? It means we want to warm up our joints, we want to warm up our spine and all of the joints. So, knowing anatomy, we can say that, okay, this joint moves in all of these directions. So we need to come up with a list of uh, gentle exercises uh, to warm up those joints and move them in all the directions, right? So let's say the spine, we're gonna um, bend forward and back and side to side and rotate. And that's a good warm up for the spine. And uh, now basically that's it. Another cool thing, uh, about Pilates, there's so many trees that I can identify here. Another very cool thing um, about uh, Pilates is that I think originally Joe, in Joe Pilates is the inventor of Pilates or inventor of Contrology, which was uh, the original name for Pilates. Uh, and now we just call it Pilates uh, because Joe passed away and um, of course, we're using his last name to commemorate his legacy. 
Now, <clears throat> originally Joe, I believe, not I believe, but I can tell that he borrowed um, all of his knowledge uh, from all the other sports that he's ever played or all the other methods of exercises that he's observed or tried plus dance and gymnastics and he uh, created a method based on all of those together he kind of combined them into this one universal body movement method that uh, uh, pretty much takes the best and combines them all into one and ensures that your entire sorry that your entire body is uh, worked out that it's not just uh, you know uh, let's say just your glutes or your arms or just your legs he ensures that your body is um, fully developed meaning uh, it's a balanced muscle development right a whole body movement which is one of the principles of Pilates whole body movement balanced muscle development meaning that we're not going to focus on any specific part like having a leg day or having you know an arm day or an ab day we are going to focus on the entire body as a system all the time every time all right, uh, we're getting close to the waterfalls and I'm getting thirsty, so I'm gonna hang up the phone for now and uh, meet you at the waterfall. Peace. One day, hopefully, you can also make it here and enjoy this treat by yourself in person. But for now, I hope I can do a good job and Oh my God, the river is so full. I've never seen it this full. <gasps> well, yeah, at the bottom. Oh, we're gonna identify this tree after. Oh my God, usually we can, there's just a small pool, but today it's a whole big river because it's a snow melt off. Oh wow, this is just phenomenal.
Isn't this amazing? Now, I think it's a little bit too loud uh, to hold a class here. Uh, the water is running loud. Now, if I move the phone any further away, I believe the sound will be lost. So we're just going to enjoy the sign here and uh, then do find a cool spot to do some Pilates um, somewhere else. I'm excited. back to our tree identification guide. I took it with us and I found a bunch of coniferous trees that I would love to identify. So let's go ahead, grab the book and give it a shot. I always pick up trash wherever I go. I usually have extra bags just for that. Now, if you see glass, uh, ask your parents to pick it up. Don't pick it up yourself. But nevertheless, I'm walking barefoot so uh, imagine somebody else walking and stepping onto this this would be um, not a, um, a good thing especially in the middle of the forest like that in the middle of nowhere where we have to hike back out uh, with the glass in your foot would not be nice so please wherever you go uh, pick up the trash uh, nature will thank you believe me all right, we got our uh, book again and we're gonna use the keys. I hope you can hear me. Look at the moss and all the little baby ants on it. Isn't this beautiful? Oh my God. Wow. All right, let's go and try to identify this conifer tree over here. Now, this is, I believe, a branch that fell off the bigger tree and the bigger tree is standing right over here. So let's get closer to this uh, bigger tree so that we can look at the bark and everything else together. And look how beautiful it is standing right by the waterfall and let's begin our identification so we're gonna start with our keys as per usual we're going to first go on to page 28 that's where our key is and of course we know that we are already at 1a because this is a conifer tree it is not a deciduous tree which would bring us to 1b so we're starting with 1a leaves needle like or scale like evergreen seeds usually in cones not uh, enclosed sorry not enclosed in a fruit conifer and now we're moving to uh, number two leaves scale like concealing the twigs 2a or 2b leaves needle-like not concealing the twigs let's see are these leaves scale like or needle-like I would say they are scale like and are they concealing the twigs well I would say yeah they're concealing the twigs it's kind of hard to see the twig here right 
like especially right here right here we can see them a little bit but well the branches we can see the branches but not the twigs perfect we got our uh, first identification so leaves scale like leaves scale like concealing the twigs will take us to number three three a leaf covered twigs flattened seed cones ellipsoid or 3b leaf covered twigs round or warp squarish in cross section all right let's see leaf covered twigs flattened or leaf covered twigs round leaf covered twigs flattened or round let's explore leaf covered twigs flattened or round well I would say this is pretty flat looks pretty flat to me right I mean the branch is round but I believe the twig is what's coming out of the branch and I believe that is absolutely flat and the second part uh, leaf covered twigs round or squarish in cross section no leaf covered twigs flattened seed cones ellipsoid well can we find any seed cones Ooh, there they are i don't know if they come from this tree because there's other conifers here let's see if there are any oh i don't know if we'll be able to find any cones on the tree because it seems like this tree is either dying or something has happened to it where it lost a lot of its branches so i don't see any um cones on the tree as of right now but right under the tree i found this guy which is i would say pretty ellipsoid right let's take a look at what an ellipsoid is an ellipsoid is a surface that can be obtained from a sphere by deforming it by means of directional scalings or more generally of an affine transformation well that's pretty confusing let's see if we can find oh examples today we are exploring real world examples of ellipsoids an ellipsoid is a three-dimensional figure whose plane sections are ellipses or circles so basically a squashed sphere nice things like american footballs and eggs can be considered ellipsoids and let's see if we can find any more cones right under here i think that's plenty right because we have these cones that maybe have been eaten or just rotted away and then a couple of these cones oh this is a good one right there and this looks pretty ellipsoid to me right all right let's see so if we go to 3a leaf covered twigs flat seed cones ellipsoid then it is tui applicata Pacific Western New Cedars. Oh, maybe here, 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 here. Western Red Sea. Tui applicata. Yes. Western Red Cedar. Tui applicata. There we go. And this one looks like it, but the cones don't exactly look that way right so maybe we are somewhere else maybe it's a different subspecies or let's see if any of those have cones like that no um uh, well it's probably something very similar western red cedar that's how it looks western red cedar that's the bar These are the leaves here. 
So this is probably a cedar. I just wouldn't know whether it's the western red cedar. But um, yeah, look at all these cones underneath. Yeah, there is a lot of cones here. I believe they belong to this tree. Let's look at the bark closer. All right, I'm going to uh, take a couple of these cones and there is a little branch right here, right? And take it for further identification um, in the car or at home. All right, oh, and we found a lucky penny. Guys, check this out. Wow, thank you fairies. Lucky penny, that's great, my kids would love it. Potential misstep that we took an identification of um, Tui applicata. Um, and that would be uh, 3A, leaf-covered twigs flattened, seed cones ellipsoid, or 3B, leaf-covered twigs round or squarish in cross-section, seed cones spherical berry-like. So the misstep would not be um, with the cones, right? Because we figured out that the cones are uh, ellipsoid sh in shape. But uh, the leaf covered twigs flattened or the leaf covered twigs round, that I did not understand the depth of that question. So now that I've read leaf covered twigs round or squarish in cross section, I'm thinking that we probably have to take the twig and cut it to see to see uh, what it looks like in the cross section whether it's going to be round or square so let's go ahead and do that I found remember I found this little branch on the floor so we're gonna use this one um, I'm going to take my multi tool and we're gonna cut a nice cross section let me just separate a little bit here. Excellent. All right. Let's try to go clean. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but uh, you see, this is where I cut the twig. So now I can can you see that? Oh yeah, I think you can see it pretty well. Okay, so uh, leaf covered twigs flattened. This is the twig right here. This is the twig. Leaf covered twigs flattened or leaf covered twigs round or squarish in cross section. 100% they are flattened. So we were correct, but I didn't actually, uh, you know, cut the cross uh, to find the cross section. So I was just right by, um, you know, I don't know, intuition or whatever else that you name that. Um, but now we are um, double checked and we for sure know that leaf covered twigs um, flattened and that seed cones are ellipsoid. So definitely that is our beautiful Tui Applicata. And uh, before we go, I just want to say how thankful I am to the beautiful nature and to my life for bringing me to such amazing places on such beautiful days. We are so lucky, we're so lucky you guys. Um, so blessed to uh, be experiencing life right now. You won't believe what I found as I'm walking. Ta-da! <laughs> I found a gummy. Aw. What a cool find. It's nice and smooshed. <laughs> I 
I got so excited. I was like, what is this? This must be some new species of something. <laughs> I think I just found the most beautiful flower in the world. Check this out. Can you believe this? Isn't this absolutely gorgeous? If you happen to know what these are, please share in the comments. Hey guys, so I took uh, a random turn to try to find uh, a cool spot to do a class with you uh, for our evening Pilates and then I found, look, this incredible water reservoir and um, it has this, um, I don't know what it is, Tsvetenia is how I would say it in uh, Russian language but I'm not sure how to say it in English. I will look look it up. Half the reservoir is red like this. Isn't it beautiful? Is it lichens? No, this not this cannot be lichens. Or maybe, right? It's some sort of an organism. Oh look! Oh. Guys, look at that. Oh my god. These baby fish or baby frogs probably. They're eating that. And there's so many of them. There. Look how big. Oh my god, this is incredible. Look how beautiful. It's like a big round body with a why am I getting that spot? Is that the sun? And look, there is a whole school of fish, tiny little fish, right there. Oh. Wow. tails wiggling but then the cloud and the reflection of the clouds it doesn't let the camera focus on those um, creatures for some evening Pilates by the lake. I found the perfect spot. It's sunny and uh, it's fairly quiet here. Um, a couple of people just arrived, but um, I don't think that'll be an issue at all. Now, while walking to the spot, I found this gorgeous beauty right here. Look at her. And of course, we're going to identify her. And um, just from watching previous YouTube videos, I know that uh, long pine, uh, long needles uh, most definitely mean that it is a pine. But look at this. Look at how long these beauties are. Look. Wow. That is pretty big, right? Let me see, compared to my hand. 
This is my hand, and this is how big the needles are. Oh, wow. And the needles are not flat, I don't think, or are they? All right, we're going to come back to identify the tree. For now, let's uh, go and do some Pilates. join me for this um, intuitive mat flow. I'm not going to call it uh, power Pilates, I'm not going to call it today anything, uh, but just allow my body to feel what it wants to do and follow uh, the body. We're going to again begin in standing, lift our arms up and just reach to the sky, feeling your spine stretch like you're growing taller and taller and taller creating room and space in your body between your pelvis and your rib cage for all of your organs then stretch take a deep inhale on the exhale open the heart reach the arms back take a big circle and on the exhale round the spine forward let's bend the knees to Inhale, reach up, exhale, dive forward. Warming up the spine, the reach tall. Reach your chest forward, spinal extension, and exhale into flexion. Inhale up straight and circle the arms as you exhale and dive forward. One more time, reach to the sky. Open the arms, open the shoulders, reach the chest forward, and then round the spine forward. We're going to interlace the fingers, reach the arms up, and step about a shoulder distance away from each other. We're going to lean to the right, we're going to keep the spine straight, and then hinge forward, create a circle, go to the left and then lift all the way up and side bend to the left alternating sides and go down around stretching the spine stretching the hamstrings and lift all the way up and side bend and down around over to the next side and back up and over to the left down around and all the way up Let's bring our arms down and onto either the waist or the hips. We're going to turn our left foot out and side bend to the left, allowing the hip to open, the lower back and side to stretch, look up at the sky and lift yourself all the way back up. One more time like this. We're going to side bend, very simple, and allow this And then lift yourself all the way back up. We're going to parallel our left foot, open up our right foot, and side bend to the right. And lift back out and up. And again, side bend to the right. Feeling the stretch in the inner thigh and the top of the hip here. And lift all the way back up. Let's pivot our feet back in together and I just feel something is going to be in my way a little bit and actually let's go all the way back down let me go to the side and begin our flow we're going to lower down and build our hundred we're going to lift the arms up begin with the feet on the ground the knees bent and let's place our feet fist distance apart from each other. We're going to take a deep inhale in, close the ribs to the front, lift our chest, lifting through the sternum, all the way to the bottom of the scapula, and stop here for a moment. 
sink our belly button all the way down to the floor. Lift our right arm, leg up into tabletop. Lift our left leg up into tabletop. And then if you would like, you can extend the leg either straight up, just like this. Keep your shoulders down. You can reach your leg right in front of you. That's a little more advanced. Make sure you're not lifting your lower back here. Make sure your belly is pulling down, not bulging up. And begin to pump the arms. Breathing in, two, three, four, five. Breathing out, two, three, four, five. In, two, three, four, five. Out, two, three, four, five. Inhaling for five counts. And exhaling for five counts. Now you can have this breath as percussive. to the mat. Gorgeous. And lift the arms up and over the head. One last time. Exhale. Arms come up. Chin in. Chest comes up. Shoulders down. Lift up. And reach all the way over. Reaching past the toes. Lift up. Sit nice and tall. Squeeze the seat and begin to descend. Vertebra by vertebra by vertebra by vertebra. Counting and going all the way down. We're going to circle the arms around and bring them by the side of the body. We're going to skip the rollover for now. Maybe I'll feel like it later. In original mat flow, you would have a rollover at this point. Here, we're going to move straight into leg circles. We're going to flex our uh, left foot and point and lift our right leg up. From here, 
let's work in a turnout today to release the tension from the quad and bring this more into the inner thigh. We're going to always start by bringing the leg across the body. Keep your hip down on the ground and then swing it down around and lift up. And then again, across, down, around, and up. Notice how little my torso is moving. And that's called core uh, uh, trunk stabilization. I am trying to keep my core engaged throughout to keep my body still and unaffected by the movement of the leg. Let's do it again. We're gonna go across, and we're gonna sweep and reach, across and sweep and reach, across and sweep and catch, across and sweep and catch. One more time, and around and up. And let's go to the other side. Open, go down, come up. Open, go down, lift up. Three more, and down and up. And two, and down. the foot five times here you can bend the knee slightly if your knee slightly bend that's okay I started with my knee very bent right and then I'm going I'm pushing myself to go straighter with the leg and in time it straightened and you can always do like circles with the knee fully bent at 90 degrees and just go across and down around and up you can always help yourself with the hand a little bit I don't know if your hand that far. We're gonna flex the right leg, reach it down, and then point and lift our right leg. Turn out and go into five circles, starting going inward or across the body, and then down and up, and across, sweep, lift. The hip is rooted to the ground. This is the newer version of the leg circle. Joe had a version where you would lift the hip and then go down and then lift up. That's a fun version to try. We'll do it next time. It felt so good just now. For now, let's stick to the uh, this one. And now open the leg to the side. Sweep down, lift up. Open, sweep, lift. Open, reach down, come up. Open, reach down, come up. I just had a nice creature fly right over <laughs> my eyes. We're going to flex and point the foot several times and then reach it down and reach it away from the hip socket, lengthening through the legs. We're going to now lift up into a seated position. We're going to use our roll-up exercise to lift up. That's what I always use to come from, low, uh, from uh, being on my back to seated. So arms reach up over the sky over the head, not to the sky, not yet. Deep breath in, exhale up, chin in, chest comes up and you lift and you reach and you try not to move your legs and you come up and you sit nice and tall. We're going to try to do the rolling like a ball here, which uh, might not be the best idea, but I really do feel like it right now. So let's give it a shot and if it doesn't work, we'll move forward. For rolling like a ball, we're going to sit uh, and to sit right off or like slightly behind from our sit bones. I have something hard, <laughs> so it's hard to identify my sit bones right now. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to pull our belly button in to engage our core units, to engage our inner unit, our powerhouse. And that powerhouse is going to hold us up in space when we lift the legs off the ground. Point the toes, uh, bring your hands onto the ankles just like this. The elbows are on the outside and create a super round shape with your body like a ball. From here, we're gonna inhale as if we're falling on the rocking chair and then exhale, come up and then stop yourself with your core. It's a little bit uneven here, so I hope you are uh, having a uh, easier time finding your balance here at the top but we're gonna continue rolling inhale back exhale up inhale back exhale up on the inhale and exhale both we're going to continue to scoop our belly button inwards and upwards to stabilize us in this rolling motion 
position as your hundred so your chest is lifted and you are lifted to the bottom of your shoulder blades or your scapula and the abdominals are cooling in as you switch 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 five four three two one two knees come in and lower yourself all the way down two feet go down on the ground let's take a quick spiral stretch and send your knees over to the right take a breath in and go across to the left take a breath in we are not going to focus right now as much on stretching because we had a full day of adventure beautiful bird flying over and um, our body is pretty warm so I feel like a good exercise flow is what we need we're going to come back up and we're going to do our double um, leg stretch. We're going to lift into our ab curl, right away reach our shoulders down, reach our shoulder blades down, uh, not toward each other, but down towards the uh, lower back. And then from here, keep our knees bent, reach two hands on top of the knees, stay lifted in the ab curl, take a breath in, on the exhale, reach the arms and the legs straight inhale and exhale actually let's reverse the breathing here uh, I got a little bit confused let's do inhale as we stretch everything engaging through the powerhouse and exhale as we recoil back in so from here both arms and legs straighten as we inhale exhale back in inhale exhale recoil staying lifted with the chest throughout if you need to lift the chest a little higher as you recoil do so try not to drop the chest where only your head is lifted make sure you're still in the proper ab curl now let's do six of these and 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 inhale exhale inhale exhale two more and in last time and in and lower the spine down two feet on the ground we're moving on and we're going to go into our third exercise from the series of five we're gonna go into single straight leg stretch so it's going to work our powerhouse our trunk stabilization and also it's going to stretch our hamstring we're going to begin by lifting one leg at a time into tabletop and then lifting our chest into the ab curl from here right leg goes straight up left leg goes straight up if you know uh, climb a tree exercise you're going to walk your hands uh, just like that right above your knee you never want to grab yourself here and if your knee is slightly bent that's totally fine just try not to lift your chest to the knee try to bring your knee to the chest and let's begin we're gonna pulse towards the chest for two and then switch one two and switch one two one two one two one two one two one two getting the knee close to the chest 
staying lifted throughout with the chest in a beautiful ab curl. Tip of the shoulder blades just off the ground. One, two, one, two, one, two. You can look at your toe. One, two, one, two, one, two. One, two. Last two, knees in, lower down. Rest your feet on the ground. We are going uh, to go uh, straight into crisscross from here. So we're skipping our double straight leg stretch as I feel a little bit too lazy for that one today, to be honest. We're going to bring our legs to tabletop one at a time and then lift our chest up. From here, we're gonna bring the arms out, circle them and bring the palms by the uh, bottom of the skull. Now, or you can bring the hands onto the ears, making sure you're not resting your head too much on the palms of the hands. From here, we're going to extend our right leg straight and then rotate up and across to the left knee and then go straight across and straight across. Lift up and across. Lift up and across. Continue like this. Try to follow your gaze into the direction of your movement. It will help you twist more and twist. Up and across, up and across. And four, and three, and two, and one. Bend the knees into the chest. Lower yourselves all the way down. And let's come back up. We're going to uh, skip the spine stretch forward and the open leg rocker for today and I feel like moving straight into our swimming right let's go onto our belly and today's uh, exercises are all by the lake notice right by the lakes all right we're going to start on our belly and let's hang out here for just a moment ah, enjoying our abdominal <laughs> work from here Take a deep breath in and then relax and exhale out. From here, we're going to reach the arms up and over the head, engage through the powerhouse, which is our center, and bring our legs um, about a hip distance apart. Squeeze the glute and now lift your right arm and your left leg and feel like you're reaching them away from each other and then up and then lower down. Left arm, right leg reach, reaches up and lower down and lift and lower and lift and lower. I always like to start by touching the ground and then progress into the full exercise. We're going to lift everything now and begin to swim. Breathing in, two, three, four, five. Breathing out, two, three, four, five. Breathing in, two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five. In, two, three, four, five. Out, two, three, four, five. You can always bring your arms out to the side or reach your arms back and continue to swim the legs. Keep your chest lifted. Keep your abdominals pulled in. Keep reaching your shoulder blades towards one another. And swim. Breathing in, two, three, four, five. Out, two, three, four, five. In, two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five. And lower down and back into child's pose knees together heels together sit your hips onto the heels and stretch all the way forward take a deep breath in and then exhale out and exhale out we're gonna move all the way forward now onto our bellies and go into single leg kick we're going to prop ourselves up onto the on our forearms and then um, lift our belly off the mat, scoop the abdominals. Oh, I just saw a bird. A bird caught either a fish or a snake and it was uh, flying with it. How awesome. All right, back to our single leg kick. So the pubic bone will stay firmly on the mat. The abdominals are lifting up and your legs are here either uh, hip distance apart or together. The, che uh, the shoulders are away from the ears. We're not sinking like this, right? We're always propping ourselves up and bringing our shoulders down. From here, we're going to try to keep our pelvis on the mat, just like it is our pubic bone without lifting it. We're gonna start, try to stay in hip extension. Right leg bends, we're gonna kick 
One, two, and lengthen it out. One, two, lengthen. One, two, lengthen. Alternating legs, kicking for two, and lengthen. One, two, lengthen. Trying to keep the glutes engaged so that our pelvis is not, is not walking around. It's staying nice and still and stabilized. One, two, stretch. 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 Last time, stretch and lower down. Let's create a little diamond shape with the hands and on. <clears throat> we're not gonna lower our chin down. We're gonna just hover right over it. A little bit of uh, propping here. You can always go down if you like, just like this. We're gonna separate our hips, our feet, um, about a hip or shoulder distance from here. We're going to turn out both legs and we're gonna lift them up and we're gonna go into heel beats. So the engage, the glute is engaged, the hamstring is engaged, the entire leg is working, the legs are turned out, they're lifted, and you're gonna beat the heels. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and lower all the way down. From here, we're going to come all the way back up and into child's pose one more time. Take a deep breath in through the nose. Exhale out through the mouth. Inhale in through the nose. Exhale out through the mouth. We're going to come back onto the belly and then turn onto the side for some side leg kicks. All right, options with the hands. You can always lay down just like this, extending your arm um, all the way straight. Make sure your back is straight. Your head is not tilting forward like this to look what's there. Your head and neck are in line with the rest of the spine and your legs can move slightly forward to create a little flexion of the hip. And thank you. <laughs> and we're going to either do that or keep them straight in line with the rest of the spine. From here, the top leg, whichever leg that is for you, well, let's explore uh, our other hands. We can also bring the hand under uh, the ear just like this and bring our top hand in front. Make sure that if you're using this position that you're not just resting here and allowing the side to drop down, right? Because this shortens uh, this side of the spine and we want everything nice and equal. So if you're using this position and if you have it in you, maybe lift your side off the mat, right? And although you're stabilizing your head, you're um, still ensuring the length in both sides of the waistband. From here, we're going to lift our top leg, flex the foot and go into very traditional, flex the bottom foot too, to stabilize you better. We're gonna kick the leg to the front, pulse for two and bring the leg to the back, pulse for two. As you kick to the front, the foot is flexed. As you reach the back, the foot points. One, two, 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 one, two. As you reach back, make sure that your spine stays aligned. Shoulders are squared, that you're not rotating through the spine, right? The spine is straight and the leg reaches straight back. It's hip extension and then hip flexion and hip extension and hip flexion. Trying to stabilize the trunk as the leg moves. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Last one, front for two, back for two. And now this is the way we're gonna lower down. We're gonna open the arm straight, lay the head down and then bring our top leg over to the front like this. And the bottom leg will extend, the foot will flex just like this, pushing through the heel. You're going to lift the leg straight up and down, up and down, up and down, up and up, working your inner thigh of the bottom leg and lift and lift try to connect to it i know it's not easy to connect but it's beautiful when you can lift and lift and three 
and two and one lower down and bring your legs all the way together let's prop ourselves up and swing the legs around to the other side and up on the opposite side my, for me it's going to be my left and turns out I have some trash in my pocket because I keep picking up whatever plastic I find so I'm gonna take it out momentarily and then put it back in so this way I'm not uh, rocking on that pocket at the moment all right we're going to start let's start with our elbow bent and our top right arm right in front and bring both legs to the side so many beautiful birds here it's amazing now the top leg flexes let's flex both top leg reaches up hip height so not all the way up only hip height and then we're gonna swing it to the front kick for two and reach it back one two and front for two and back for two trying to stabilize the trunk trying not to move the hips trying to keep them stacked right on one on top of the other and back two and front two and back two one two one two one two one two one two let's do a few more keep pulling your belly button in if you can it's hard to keep that in here especially on the flexion phase let's try our best and then lower the leg down actually don't lower it down bring it straight to the front like this bending your right knee the bottom leg is straight the arm straightens you lay your ear right on your bicep here uh, top arm in the front top leg in the front bottom leg flexes and begins to lift all the way up as high as you can and then lower lift and lower growing tall through the spine pushing through the heel lift and lift and lift and lift trying to connect to the inner thigh of the bottom foot and of course you're probably feeling the stretch in the right hip and lift and lift and four and three last two and one and lower the foot down let's bring our legs together and then roll on to our belly and lift ourselves up into a quadruped position from this quadruped position we're gonna set up a plank and we're going to go straight into our leg pull down we're going to start by extending our right leg back uh, let me see I highly recommend that you have something either sticky socks here or uh, my sticky socks are not so sticky anymore so I'm gonna take them off because it distracts me from the exercise and <clears throat> either barefoot or you have a good sticky surface for these ones all right let's begin in a nice quadruped with the shoulders right over the wrists with the hips right over the knees the back is nice and flat tabletop right leg steps back keeping that hip distance apart uh, distance between the legs left leg steps back we're going to make sure we're in a perfectly straight line here beautiful plank everybody from here we're gonna roll forward onto the toe bringing the weight into the uh, wrists into the shoulders and then roll back into the heels roll forward roll back let's do it quickly so that our wrists don't hurt let's do one more time and back forward back forward back and from here we're going to bring our right leg straight and kick it up one two flex lower left leg one two flex lower roll forward roll back right leg one two down left leg one two down roll forward roll back one more time one two down one two down roll forward roll back knees go down and child pose stretch here reach yourself all the way down extend the arms over the head take a deep breath in right into the back of the rib cage and a deep exhale out let's lift all the way up and turn not around but uh, go into a semi supine position for our leg pull up now we're going to start by sitting nice and tall and this time our hands are going to go back just behind our shoulders like this we're going
going to be at an angle, right? So our body is not straight, we're beginning at an angle. Our elbows are straight, our shoulders move away from the ears. Find a good position for yourself here. From here, the toes are pointed, the inner thighs are connected together. We're going to drive the hips straight up and hold it here. Make sure your head is not reaching all the way back. You're looking straight ahead here or straight up, but not back. Make sure there is no tension in the neck. Keep squeezing the glutes. Keep this beautiful line from the shoulder to the toes. And then lower yourself all the way down. From here, we're gonna reach the spine forward, rounding through the spine, reaching for the toes and relaxing the shoulders. Let's bring the arms back and lift ourselves up and then reach back into our slight hinging of the spine back. Toes are pointed, shoulders away from the ears. Let's drive our hips straight up, trying to reach our toes all the way to the ground, squeezing our glutes, keeping our front of the hip extended. A beautiful straight line from the shoulder to the toe. Hold it here and lower down. Make sure your powerhouse is fully engaged so that you're not all in your wrist and shoulder. Now round the spine forward, reaching past the toes, full flexion. Relax the shoulders. And lift yourself all the way back out and up. One last time here. We're gonna reach the arms back the fingertips are pointing towards the body, not away from the body. Now, lift your chest, lower the shoulders, point the toes, and drive the hips up one more time. Breathe here, make sure your head is not uh, reaching all the way back and there is no tension in your neck. Hold the plank. And for uh, leg kick up, we're gonna lift the leg up, up, down up up down that's optional up up down up up down one more time kick kick lower kick kick lower lower the hips sit nice and tall and then round the spine forward reach for the toes and let's take a deep hamstring stretch here i'm gonna flex my feet i'm gonna try to reach my elbows to the ground and my head tucks towards the knees and i'm gonna get Take a few relaxing breaths in and exhales out. Inhales in and exhales out. We're gonna lift back up. We're gonna turn onto our side and then back into quadruped because we're going to hold a side plank now. So we're gonna start in regular plank and then pivot our legs, pivot our inside, entire body to the side to do a little bit of a side work here, right? Let's begin in quadruped just like we did prior to this for leg pull down. We're going to align our shoulders right over our wrists. Our palms are flat and extended. Our knees are hip distance apart. Right leg steps back, left leg steps back and make sure that your heels are reaching back here and that your weight is equally distributed throughout the body between the shoulders, the powerhouse and the legs. From here, we're going to step our right hand right in front of our nose, pivot the legs, be on the edges of the feet, the top leg can be flat and then turn around to face the side. We're gonna reach the arms straight side, keep pushing away from the shoulder, keep pressing into your feet to distribute the weight. From here, we're going to drive our hips up and side bend. You can look towards the arm that's on the ground and then look back center, lift the arm back up, coming back into a straight line, our plank, and then let's lower our hips down towards the ground, creating a opposite stretch. This might be too hard. If it is, then skip it. Come back into straight line, our plank, and then back into side bend. Look down. 
shoulder down. Everything is aligned in a beautiful straight line. Come back into plank and then lower the hips down without letting them fully sink to the ground. Turn your head, look at the top arm, keep pushing away from the shoulder, keep driving the weight into the feet and then come back into your plank and bring the hand all the way down. I'm going to switch sides just so I face the camera but you stay in your plank and then we are going to move our left hand uh, towards the nose this time. So establish a plank if you move just like me and let's bring our left hand into the center, pivot our legs, make sure your top foot is standing firmly on the ground and your bottom foot is at least on the edge. Top arm lifts and you reach away from the shoulder, creating a beautiful straight line and the work on the side of the body. From here, we're gonna push our hips up and bring the top arm down, turn the head to look at the bottom arm. Make sure you're not sinking through the shoulder here. And then re-establish our side plank and then bring the hips down any amount. Any amount is good. Look side towards the top arm and then drive back into your side plank and then go back up and into your side bend feeling the stretch in the side of the body back into plank one more side bend in the opposite direction if that is available to you it doesn't have to be and then back into a straight line back up back into plank and let's lower the arm down Let's bring our knees one by one to the mat and sit back into child pose and relax. Deep breath in through the nose, exhale out through the mouth. Rise up, reach your arms straight in front of you and let's circle our wrists. Let's um, pronate and supinate them. I actually have a video about that, so check that out. Our wrists don't really rotate, right? But they, uh, well, they don't go in a circle, but they lift, turn to lift the palm up and turn to lift the palm down, which is called supination for bringing the arm up and pronation for reaching the arm down. Soup, like you're asking for some soup or holding a bowl of soup and you don't want to spill it. And pronation is prone. <laughs> and let's continue to move our wrists just to give them a little break here any which way you can and we are going to set up for a really cool exercise called boomerang and it's super advanced but let's do what we can because I feel like finishing up with a beautiful boomerang today so we're going to start Boomerang is a combination of many exercises together, but <clears throat> watch me first maybe, and then let's do a few together. We're gonna sit nice and tall, just like for spine stretch forward or for um, whatever else exercises we did. Uh, <clears throat> we're gonna cross our legs one on top of the other, stay sitting nice and lengthened through the spine, pointed through the toe. From here, the hands are right by the side of the hip with the um, fingers pointing straight forward, not back like this, straight ahead. We're going to almost lift our hips up, engaging our powerhouse, and then tip back and bring the legs up and over the head parallel to the floor. From here, shoulders are down. Make sure you're not rolling onto your head and neck. You're just on your shoulder. We're going to open and cross the legs. We're going to peel down through the spine one vertebra at a time and lift into our teaser. Or if you know yoga, I believe it's a boat pose. From here, arms open to the sides. You dive forward as the arms reach back. Interlace the arms and then give yourself a little stretch here. Open the arms, reach them past the toes. And then restack the spine, bring the arms by the sides of the hips. You want to try it with me? Let's go ahead and do it. We're going to exhale. Tip back, bring the legs up and over, open cross. And then as we're peeling down, we're going to hop, lift the chest, lift the torso, almost into seated position. The legs are lifted, arms open to the sides, 
dive forward interlace arms reach the arms up and over give yourself a little stretch and an extra pulse here open the arms reach them past the toes and lift yourself sitting up nice and tall two more like this scoop the abdominals almost lifting your sit bones off the ground and then rock back bring the legs back with you keep your uh, shoulders relaxed open cross and then peel up sit into your boat pose or your teaser arms open arms reach back dive forward and pass the toes and rise back up one last time and tip back open cross lift up and bring the arms east west and then reach them back dive forward and reach the arms all the way past the toes and let's stay here for a moment deep breath in exhale out bring the arms by the sides lift ourselves all the way up and let's be done for today if you would like a tutorial individual for individual exercises from this series I will be posting those very shortly explaining in detail how each exercise works so that uh, nothing uh, confuses or scares you like the boomerang um, I hope you enjoyed this little workout I sure did the uh, Sun is going to set fairly soon and I am um, camping again tonight so I have to find a cool spot and um, I'll be filming uh, all of that shortly. See you guys in a little bit. And as promised we're going to now try and use our book to identify this gorgeous beauty of a tree right here and something that I've just noticed it's pretty incredible so these cones right look at those needles oh my god these cones underneath the tree there are those cones just like that right uh, and then right over here right over here do you see what that is isn't that incredible is that even from this tree maybe it just flew in and it's now confusing me like that because I always thought that those long things were from uh, deciduous trees let's see what is that no it is a part of the tree oh, you guys are kidding me wow it's a part it's a part of a tree huh wow nature keeps on surprising me yes there they are too on the side right there how gorgeous all right I'm taking out my super incredible book and we're going to begin our identification process let's see if I can move this up just like that mm -hmm. and here we go so check this out was a part of the tree. Now let's pick out our our amazing guide, one of my favorite books now of all times, 
plants of the Pacific North, Northwest Coast and uh, written by Pojar and McKinnon and go straight to our uh, 28 page, page 28, where there is a key for identification that has been helping us so much. This key right here. And right off the bat, we know that we're going to 1A. Leaves needle-like or scale-like. It's an evergreen tree, seeds in cones, not enclosed in fruit, right? So this is not a 1B, which is uh, deciduous trees. And those are the ones that have uh, broad leaves and uh, except for our Buddhas or bodice, annually deciduous, meaning that uh, they shed their leaves and seed enclosed in fruit. So now that we know that we're at 1A, we're going to move straight down to 2. Uh, leaves scale-like, concealing the twigs, or 2B, leaves needle-like, not concealing the twigs. Well, I would say that for sure our needles are, our leaves are needle-like and they're not concealing the twigs, right? So the entire branch is covered in, it's like the whole twig is kind of like the needle. And then um, if we moved to 2B, hold on guys, there's lots of insects and they're sitting on me and sometimes I get distracted. So 2B, leaves needle-like, not concealing the twigs, moving to 4. 4A, needles in clusters. 4B, needles not in clusters. Are these needles in clusters? Let's get a little bit closer and see. Uh huh. Are these needles in clusters or not? Um, you know, friends, I would say that these are not in clusters. Let's look closer from this side. Do you see? They're kind of, they're individual. So let's say that they are not in clusters. That is where I went wrong. And um, thank goodness I have this video and I can come back to it and identify the place where I went wrong um, on this key. Now, as I was walking back and observing the forest floor, I noticed that the needles are 100% in clusters. I picked uh, I, the little dry needles that cover the forest floor or um, my path back to the car. Um, they're all in threes like this. So of course they are in clusters. You see, I just didn't know probably what a cluster uh, means or how a cluster looks until I looked a little bit closer. So uh, we went wrong right at uh, 4A and 4B. So uh, we said needles uh, not in clusters and we should have said needles in clusters. Now, if we would have said needles in clusters, and let me show you, by the way, I picked up a uh, branch that was lying by the road so that I can show you how it looks on the tree. So, there it is. And look, right here, right, oops, right, let's say, right here. You see, it's not an individual needle. I don't know, maybe the sun was too bright and I couldn't um, see or just because I didn't know better yet. So let's say if I would want to p pull one of these off, they would pull uh, as a cluster, not as an individual needle. And they're connected, right? All right, so now that we know now that we know that, we can make the correct choice. And then if we choose 4A, needles in clusters, then we move to number five. And five has two branches as well. It has 5A and 5B, needles in clusters of five and needles in clusters of two. Ours has 
needles in clusters of three. So either way, I think it is related to one of uh, the species, right? So let's see, needles in clusters of five give, gives us Pinus monticola, and needles in clusters of two gives us Pinus contorta. Let's check out what are these two Pinus trees look like. Uh, okay, right there. So Pinus contorta would be right here. Pinus contorta, it looks like this, and it's a shore pine. And I would say that because I know we're not by the shore, it's probably uh, not the correct pine. And then Pinus monticola would be uh, the one. So Pinus contorta is the one with, oh, let me get back to the key for a moment, for a second. Pinus contorta would be the one uh, with needles in clusters of two. Um, we don't have needles in clusters of two, and although I think it's definitely a pine, it's not Pinus contorta because of where we are located. We are in Trinity Forest, which is further inland, away from the shore. Now, uh, the next, the, uh, the next, uh, possibility, right, would be Pinus monticola, the uh, trees with needles and clusters of five. And this is how Pinus monticola looks. Look. And Pinus monticola is also called Western white pine. You see? Oh, hopefully it can focus there. There we go. And I would say that our tree looks more like the uh, Pinus monticola, like the Western white pine, but it only has uh, three needles in the cluster. So it might be just different types, uh, a different subspecies, um, because um, I'm starting to understand how um, your location, how much your location matters. As I'm reading the plants of the Pacific North Coast, I should really understand that coast does mean coast and i'm a little bit away from the coast although i'm in trinity alps uh, i am in cascade range which i thought would be exactly the same because i'm away from the coast and i'm not getting that um, ocean breathe that ocean uh, air uh, i am uh, and the ocean temperatures right that I am probably dealing with uh, different subspecies. So I'm going to one day find out what it is and I'll uh, make a little video to catch up with that. But 100% it's a pine. And then there is one more cool thing that I, one cool identifier for a tree that I wanted to show you while we're here. A way to identify uh, a tree by whether their needles are stalked or stalkless. And I wanted to show you while we have this tree with us um, what a stalked uh, needle looks like. So this is a stalk of the needle, you see? So this needle would be called stalked, right? It doesn't come out straight out of the twig. And my, uh, I believe the uh, fir tree that we were identifying yesterday in uh, the previous video, that that one um, was uh, considered to be stalkless needle. It kind of went straight into the twig as, a, as if a twig has a hole and it just plants itself all the way in there or comes straight out of there. And then the twig looks like this, let me show you. Right from the branch. Right. You see this little part right here? So I think that that's what they mean by saying stalk. Right there, this little guy. All right, well, I'm so happy I uh, have this video and I could uh, look and see where I went wrong and fix my mistakes. But again, um, let's just get back to the video.